What happened with your situation exactly? So, when I was 18 years old, from when I was second grade, I took Adderall. Well, yeah, that was at that f- point, I was taking medication for ADD, mm-hmm. right? And then that was at a chemical compound in the Adderall that was an amphetamine. Didn't yeah. that, I didn't know that, right? At that age, you 18, 19 years old, you don't know what's in that, right? Mm-hmm. You're just doing what you got to do to be able to pass classes and just feel normal, right? So that was the situation. And mind you, Adderall is not even on the ban list. So mm-hmm. even when you look it up and I had a bottle in my hand, I could never see, oh, Adderall is not on the ban list, right? right? So I dealt with that situation. So I was in college. So I really didn't, I really wasn't punished because it was more of a professional punishment that was handed down to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was still able to compete. And then once I came back, uh, it was a two-year suspension. And then one they year passed. The, oh, they, yeah. they, one year passed. And after that one year passed, I won NCAA championships again, everything like that. They sent me a letter and saying, we're lifting your ban. In the history of track and field, the history of <laughs> drug testing, that has never, never been happening. Yeah, never happened. I don't, I've never heard anybody say, hey, we're just going to lift your ban. You're good. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what happened. So then fast forward to about 2006, I was in a situation where I was working with this massage therapist. And I broke it off with him where I didn't want none of his business because I feel like he was trying to extort me. Mm. Right? He wanted more money. You know what I mean? Because he saw the success that was coming from 04, 2003, 2004, 2005, mm-hmm. and he was still getting paid what he was supposed to get paid because that was our deal, right? Right. So he felt like, well, you know, this person's getting paid. That person's over there getting paid. You know, they getting little bonuses. Everybody's happy except for me. So I fired him, you know? It was a collective. We got together with my agent and my coach. and was like, you know, you know, we got to let this person go because it's becoming toxic to our, our circle. Mm-hmm. So then... Crunch time happened, couldn't find anybody who was up to his qualifications of what he could do as a therapist. Stretching, massage, understanding biomechanics, things like that, right? Usually those kind of people are fractured, right? So you have someone who understands biomechanics, you understand somebody who's a massage therapist. bring them together. Yeah, this person was all that in one, you know what I'm saying? So I bit the bullet and I was like, we had a conversation. I was like, man, you know, love to still work with you, you know? So we started the season off in 2006. He was still working with me. Everything was copacetic. Everything was love. We had a conversation probably mid, almost mid-season, and it got kind of a little heated. Um, We was at a race in um, Kansas City. It was a relay. Nothing major, nothing big at all. Just they invited us to come out there because it was the first annual relay they were trying to put on to make some excitement, hype from it, right? And after that race, things got funny. Like, I come across the line. He just was so adamant about, Make sure I get on the table so he can massage me. Never was acting like that before. Mm. You get on the table, he's massaging me. When you must get a massage, usually how you laying? On your stomach. All right, cool. Right? So when you lay on your stomach, you can't see what's going on behind you. Mm-hmm. Right? So it was told to me later that, yeah, he was massaging with gloves on, mm. which is unheard of, right? You know, use a massage. At therapist. that time, especially. At that time, especially, right? Yeah. So then I remember getting off the table and then going doing my press conference and I remember sitting in a press conference, I'm like, man, my legs feel real tingly. Mm. You know, but the adrenaline was still pumping in me. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe it was like some biofreeze or like I'm just hype, you know what yeah. I mean? So come back after that, didn't get drug tested there. And then, well, I did get drug tested there. And then that drug test went in and that was the one that tested positive mm. for higher levels of testosterone. And so I'm just curious... Because I've seen, like, maybe more than 10 years ago, you had uh, an interview on, like, a, a news station where you apologized to the United States. And you just apologized for letting them down. But I'm trying to put myself in that situation, and, like, I don't... One, what even... Besides the love for the sport, if that... If 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 that situation did you so dirty, right, and you knew if they was wrong, why even come back? Why even put yourself back? Why even train so hard and be like, man, I'm coming back to the sport? Because I love the sport. I love it, Doug. Mm. I, I mean, as simple as that. I didn't have... And on top of that, I, I know who I am. You know what I'm saying? Like, doper, that ain't me. I'm legit. I've been legit since I was, I was a little kid. 
I was winning national titles when I was a little kid and six-time NCAA champion. So my pedigree stands for itself. So it isn't like I just came out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, it's an art to it. Like, I built myself up to be the great, the greatness that I am today. Mm. You know, I, I worked hard and I put that work in. You know what I mean? And there's no athlete that trained with me who, gonna, who would give me the side eye and be like, oh, no, dog. I'd be out there. I'd be grinding. That's me, you know? Mm. So me coming back into sport was, it was a few things. I ain't going to lie, man. It was the fact that I wanted to, I wanted to, to clear my name, mm. right? So it can be able to open up the door to my kids have a, have a, a fair legacy to build. A clean, yeah, yeah. A clean legacy mm-hmm. to build their mm-hmm. name off of, I can right? See that. I understand that. Yeah, so that was something that really mattered to me. Never said that to my son, mm. you know what I mean? But that's something that I know was going to be with me forever, and I didn't want it to be with them. So that's why I worked hard for it as well. Did you ever try to at least sue the guy? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to sue when you don't have certain grounds to stand like on. Like clear-cut proof. Exactly, right? I'm just thinking but like... But this is what I did, though. I sued, I sued USADA. So I'm in this situation. I could talk about it now. I had a gag order on this, on me. Real talk. So for since 2008 to the year 2021, I could not, as long as I was in track and field, I was competing, I couldn't talk about the fact that I sued USADA in the court of law and I won Mm. money as well. So they were willing to pay, but their stipulation was, we're going to pay you, but... You can't, you can't talk compete. about it. Oh, oh, wow, okay. Because that will open up Pandora's box, and the, the other athletes will come back and be like, well, my situation was kind of fishy too. So maybe I want to open up this, this, uh, this box and revisit my case as well. Because through discovery in my, in my case, they were breaking a lot of their own rules. I'm cool, you got rules, and your rules are getting broken, and you're trying to uphold the law of your rules. But when you're breaking your own rules just to be able to be spiteful, to be able to catch people so it can make you look good, then I have an issue with that. And that's what happened. Through discovery in my court case, we found out that um, the packages that the, all the samples go in, right? Drug testing samples, urine cups. It goes into one big bag, right? One, yeah, one big, yeah. That don't even make sense. It don't even sound high tech at all, right? No, it Not sense. at all. It don't. It goes into one big bag and that bag is sealed. Once it's put into the transporter, meaning the truck or whatever it's going to go, is transported to the location where the lab is. Mm-hmm. Now, in between, there's a, there's a person that rides with it as in like a Brinks truck, right? right yeah, yeah. A person that's, that's handling it and rides with it, right? So he has a login. So he has to log in and say, okay, bag was open. So once the bag is tampered open, their rules state they're supposed to, they're supposed to get rid of all samples. That makes sense, though. It makes sense. Yeah, I mean, science, any cross-contamination, one, first of all, but two, if you open it, that's with anything in science and medicine, whatever. That's what I would assume. Facts. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm just saying. Facts. So with that being said, that, that the whole situation should have never happened. Mm. Never happened. That all of them samples, my sample, and everybody else's sample in this situation should have been thrown out. Mm. Should have been thrown out, right? So another situation, and that it's the lack of common sense I feel for my case that made me, and I saw how deep it went, and that's why I just like, I can show them better than I can tell them. And okay. So I'll give you an example. When you're in a bad situation, right, like I was in, they appoint lawyers to you because they say that, well, these lawyers specialize in our our kind of law. So you could pick from this pool of lawyers, right? Cool. So we go through, we're picking lawyers. All right, cool, we're going to get this lawyer. All right, cool, we're looking, doing the research, me and my parents, right? And then we realize that these lawyers... I'm still on the other side. I mean, are in bro, bed. again, I'm just... They are in is, bed with USADA. Yeah. USADA takes them on vacations at the end of the year. It's like a, a... I deal with a lot of rappers. It's like a, a, a newly rapper signing a deal and using the record label's lawyer. They We know not to do that. Facts. Well, okay, I'm listening. So, I'm young. I don't know that. My parents know nothing about track and field. Mm-hmm. Know nothing about the court of law either. We experienced all this for our first time on our own, right? High stress. So we, get, we have a first lawyer, ran through probably $200,000 using that person, right? Now, mind you, they're asking us silly questions like, well, we got a letter back from um, USADA and the IAAF, and they said, if you don't contest the science, 
then we won't try to give you a lifetime ban. Because that's what I was up against. Mm. Two, two, uh, two positives equals a lifetime ban in our sport, right? So you get one, you get one positive, that's two years. And the second one, lifetime ban. That's how it is. Mm. So they sent a letter, not provoked, saying if you don't contest our science, we will not go for a lifetime ban. But he's trying to shut you up. Right? Still, once again, young, 18, 19, 20, whatever, naive. Um, we're like, all right, cool. We just playing along. We, we abide by the rules. Come on. What, let's, we never even, it, it was never in our intentions to cheat in the first place. We feel like this whole situation was going to be fixed, right? Never did. It was the fact that we saw the dirty moves that they were trying to make. If I contested the science, or you asking me not to contest your science, there must be an issue then. Yeah, it, first of all, me contesting the science is an opportunity for me to prove my innocence, one. And two, it's kind of like in a court of law today, when we, we, we I'm just being real, a lot of African Americans, we go to jail and they give us a court, I mean, a, um, a plea deal, because, and they try to scare you because it's like if you if you do this, you can get the maximum 10, 20 years. Nobody want that. So it's like, man, I'll take a plea deal even if I didn't do anything because I, I don't want to lose. So that brings me to my next part of the, of the conversation. So that's exactly what I felt like because once again, through discovery, we found, because they gave us information to show us other cases that were similar to my case, right? So you had one guy who, got, who tested for cocaine. Mm. Cocaine. And he gave him a warning. He, he got no ban. White athlete. Then we have another guy who tested positive for Adderall, mm. but he had no prescription for it. You see what I'm saying? White guy. So all these situations mm. where are similar or worse than mine, they were giving them warnings and they were letting them go. But in my situation, I felt like because of who I was and who I was around the coach at that time and even the color of my skin, I felt like I was receiving a, a way harsher punishment to the point where you give somebody four years away from their job or what they do, their craft, that's the death sentence basically, right? Mm. And for four years, I had no income, no nothing for four years. I was lucky enough that I was making a really good amount of money to where I can live off of that money for those four years to sustain myself, right? Mm. But the fact is, I don't think they ever thought I was ever going to come back after four years. Mm. And I came back, and they didn't know what to do with me. So then they repunished me. So now after I served four years, I come back in the sport, and they quickly made up a rule where, oh, now you blackball from all diamond leagues. So that means I couldn't run any major races and make any real money. Yeah. So now yeah. you tell me I got to run these holding wall meets to make some, some coins off that was less than what my air, airfare was to even get there. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I literally was, when I came back, I really was in the mud, uh, like grinding. Yo, I want to first just say, you know, I don't know how I want to word this, but I do truly feel bad because, just being honest, let me be transparent, even me doing my research and stuff, it really ain't make sense to me because, like, if that happens to me, I'm not, like, I'm not going down just, like, I'm not going down like that. In my mind, just follow me, right? And, like, I'm coming back, I'm speaking on it every single time because y'all did me wrong. Mm -hmm. But now I think about it, I mean, you did come back at 30 or something, like, or you was older. I came right? back around, yeah, I was about maybe 20, 29. And that's when back. things start to, that's when you really start to come into yourself. I'm thinking as a young, like, a, if I came back at 25, 26, I'm pissed. Like, mm -hmm. I'm always saying something. But I guess the mindset had to be, like, just locked in. Like, we were talking about yesterday how... But I did. I, I felt just like you was feeling. You mm. understand? But as a black man in a sport that's ran by white individuals, if I came back as an angry black man, what, what was I going do? to be? Yeah. An angry black man. But you only learn, but I'm, you only understand that at 29, 30. A little bit, even, but 31, 32. That's when you really understand that. Yeah. So, yeah. So what I will say, again, um, again, we just getting acquainted with, I'm, a, I'm always, like, as transparent and real on camera. I want to say, because I don't know I wasn't there, if that's really the case, man, I'm really sorry for that. And I know I ain't had nothing to do with it. But, again, not saying, I'm not, I don't want to make it seem like I'm trying to accuse you of nothing. Oh, but no, I'm no. saying, because I wasn't there. Yeah. But if that was the case, I'm, I, I, that, like, that's, Bro, that's 
Bro, I, to this day, that would hurt. Yeah. You got to you gotta realize that I had to live with that for the rest of my life. Like, imagine, how many years ago was 2006? Like, tw yeah, almost 20 years ago, yeah, bro. Dad, I still got to live with that. And at this point, like, you can't even, again, I, it's like, I'm going to give it chills because, like, it and hurts I, when people ask me, oh, where were you? Uh, and when they reference certain dates, oh, where were you in 2008? In my mind, van. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or, or when people bring it up, period. Yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. You that's, know what I mean? that's literally a part of your story. When, a, if that's, again, I'm just being real. If that's the case, it shouldn't even be a part of your story. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that shouldn't even be, like, you can't, that's a part of the, the legacy. And that shouldn't be it. The four years cannot hold a candle to what the emotional damage it did to me, bro. Mm. I ain't going to lie. The fact is that I was smart enough to realize that whatever emotions that were off till, I had to turn into aggression to be able to come back and use it and weaponize it. That really was, was saved me mm. because Justin could not get back out there. I'm not built like that. I would have folded. I ain't going to lie. Mm. But Justin Gatlin, Jay Gat, he was built like that. I had to build a different persona. You know mm. what I mean? Because... I would walk in rooms and people look at me like I'm a ghost. They'd be like, oh, hold on, damn. Yeah, he is right there. So I had no friends when I came back, bro. Yeah, I mean, it was you know times I mean? people like booed you. Like, you got yeah. booed at Beijing? I got booed in London. I got booed in London. Yo, being shit almost, what is it, like 10 plus years now past it maybe? Mm hmm Do you ever think about it? Like, because you, like, again, you can't do an interview without people bringing it up because it's a part of the story. Yeah. Like, do you still think about it to this day sometimes? Like a what if or just think about a period? Not nah, like just think, not what if, but like just oh, the messed yeah. up part. Yeah. Like, yeah. It was, for a long time, it, I thought about it daily, dog. Mm. Da daily, because it was a part of my life. It was times where, as we spoke in, early in this conversation, it was times where you talking about me going out and being acknowledged. It was times where I did not want to be acknowledged. Mm. I was embarrassed to be in public, bro. It, I was afraid that somebody was going to come up to me and talk to me and and mention that because I wasn't I wasn't healed yet. You know what I'm saying? It was hard for me to even discuss and talk about this like we're talking about it now mm. without me crying about it because I felt like years in my career were taken from me mm. and I could never get them back. A lot of times with the hurt comes anger, right? And I'm curious, and this is just for me, I do a lot of interviews and sometimes I get people who are seasoned and are able to talk about the past and, the, and reflect on it and the learning things. But then other people, more more sort of younger artists or younger people, they don't want to talk. They say, I don't want to talk about this. How important or not important is it for you to be able to talk about it and just talk about it freely? Uh, and really important. It's really important, Doug. I'm, I think that's a good thing about this generation now and where we're at in society where a lot of people have their own social media. They, own, they can use their own voice. Mm. I didn't have the opportunity to use my own voice, you know? Um, so I felt like I was always subjected to whatever the media was going to say about me, and that's who I was. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But now, it's very important for you to get your point across. Why not? There's always two sides to a story. My mom, my mom would always tell me, it's two sides to a story, and somewhere in the middle lies the truth. Mm. So if you don't tell what your side is, the world's always going to take the side that's out there, mm. and they're going to think that's who you are. You're a bad guy, you a doper, you, you this, you ignorant, you whatever. But if you don't tell who your side of the story, what do you have to stand on? Mm. 